good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. I'm glad Eric and his family get a, a weekend away. So, Eric, if you're watching, hello. Y'all can just wave at him if you want. He's looking in the back. Um, but no, so glad. And this is a really cool series that we're in, The Greats. I don't know if y'all remember, but we actually did a similar series last year, uh, just highlighting some of these heroes of the faith. And so in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, it starts out, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, um, in this life of faith, let us strip off everything that weighs us down and let us run with perseverance. And so it's this just really encouraging uh, verse. And then the chapter before in Hebrews 11, it just goes through and just summarizes some really great heroes of the faith. They did some incredible things, endured through, you know, incredible hardships, maybe, you know, took incredible leaps of faith, things like that that can really inspire us and encourage us. And, and, and so today we are diving in. Uh, we already looked at Gideon. We looked at Samuel. And today is Joseph. Uh, God shapes, the, um, shapes us for greater purpose through some of the toughest circumstances and seasons in our lives. And this is beautifully and painfully illustrated in the life of Joseph. Um, his story begins in Genesis 37. It's the first book of the Bible. Lots of things have been happening. And so if you have your, your Bible app or anything like that, we've got to cover a lot of scripture because I really want to highlight through some of the, the makings of Joseph. So I'm going to read in the New Living Translation on the Bible app, and like I said, you're welcome to just follow along through some of these chapters. We're going to go quickly, and it might be good for you to skim read with me. Um, but so, just to give you the, the picture where we're at, so Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the promised son of Abraham. So remember the father Abraham, and, and he had many sons, and many sons had father, uh, every time. And um, so anyway, so he had this, this, this promised son, Isaac, and, and so then Isaac, uh, you know, was that, that was an awesome story in itself, and he's a hero of the faith that that we can learn a lot from, and then from Isaac became his um, son Jacob, and Jacob then had 12 sons, and this is a problem here, is that out of that 12, he had a most favorite, Joseph. If I've got two girls, I can see this can get tricky at times when one's going through different seasons in life, how, you know, one might be a little easier to tend to than the other or whatever, um, but this really went on to, to another level, not, not, the, not the, the wisest parenting advice to have a favorite son, but more than that, to let it be known. And so, um, so in this, he had 12 brothers. Here they all are. These are actually photos of them from their, their family portrait. And um, so if you notice, Joseph stands out a little bit because his dad gave him this coat of many colors. And it probably looked something like this, you know, some colorful robe that he wore. But, but it made him stand out from the other brothers. And so it could have looked something more like that. We're not really sure, or maybe something like this one. Um, I'm not sure how, how manly Joseph was, but, I mean, I know he's fashionable. Um, it could have been more 80s throwback style, you know, some more shapes like that. And then, um, you know, but I, we don't know. But anyway, so he had this special coat, basically. And so um, with this coat, definitely made it stand out. So this family, and this is something to note, was very dysfunctional it, it Jacob had not one but two wives he had a favorite wife and the other wife he also had a couple concubines you know so this family had a lot of these dynamic issues going on and so you might think well you don't understand my family is pretty crazy well this one would give you a run okay and so um let's pick up in chapter 37 and let's just kind of let's let's get to know uh Joseph Jacob and his family so uh, in chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 2, this is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he uh, often attended his father's flock, and he worked with his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bila and Zipha. Uh, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things they were doing. So I don't know if this was him being a tattletale or him just being an upright dude. I, because of the things that progressed in his life, I think he was just an upright dude. And so when he saw his brothers doing things they shouldn't be doing, or maybe they're, they're, maybe they're just giving dishonest reports back to their dad, I don't know, uh, Joseph wasn't the one to call him, call him out on it. So the brothers are off, you know, tending to the flock. And so Jacob uh, loved Joseph more than the others. Um, Joseph had been born to him by, in his old age and um, by his special wife. He made him that special robe. So skip down. Um, let's see... So they went to pasture the, sh the flock in Shechem. So he's 17, teenager, and, and uh, Jacob sends him and says, go check on your brothers, report back to me how things are going. And this is kind of where you can kind of see maybe some, 
some shadiness going on in, in, in the family because the brothers were supposed to be in one place. He gets there, they're not. They're actually a day's well, you know, journey over this way. So he kind of finally tracks them down, and they see him coming, and, and they say, oh, let's, let's find this verse. Uh, they went to pasture, and then they arrived. A, a guy told them where to find them. And when Joseph, in verse 18, when Joseph's brother saw him coming, because, again, he's wearing a colorful robe. There was no mistaking, like, there he is. There's, uh, they recognized him in the distance. Well, before this, Joseph had some dreams. Again, okay? I'm not one to really remember my dreams, but he had these dreams, and he made the mistake, probably, of sharing these dreams at the breakfast table. So he wakes up, and he's like, oh, man, you guys can believe this dream I had. There were 11 stalks of uh, grain, and they all bowed down to me, my stalk of grain. And then he tell, explains this other one. And so these brothers are like, you think we're just going to bow down to you? I mean, you think you're better than us? So, I mean, they already had these roots of jealousy and some animosity there. And this just fuel on the fire, you know what I mean? And so he has two dreams, and even his dad is like, you know, what do you think? You think we're all going to bow down to you because you had a dream about these 11 stars bowing to your star and even the moon and the sun? I mean, is your mother and I going to bow to you too? It was weird, right? And so this just like really got to this point. So when these brothers are out in the field and they see the dreamer coming up, they see the favorite coming up, this is kind of what happens. They saw him come and they recognized him from the distance. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Kill him. Not like, man, let's give him a hard time. Not, you know, let's just ignore this guy. Let's just ditch him. Let's just get rid Kill him. Come on, let's kill him and throw him in. Uh, one of those cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal eating him. And then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. I mean, these are some hardened hearted dudes. Uh, when Reuben heard of this scheme, okay, this is one guy that was a little softer. He said, well, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just toss him in one of these cisterns to rot and die. That's a lot better, you know, than other things. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off his beautiful robe he was wearing. They grabbed him and threw him in one, into the cistern. And the cistern was empty, so there's no water in it. Then they just uh, sat down to eat and threw his brother in a cistern. I'm sure they can hear his cries, hear his pleas, you know, you know, let me out of here, help me, you know, whatever. There's no way he can get out on his own. And they're just sitting down to have a meal. I mean, I'm just like trying to picture the position that these guys are in. I mean, and not that it's just total fault of their own. I mean, this was not an overnight thing. This was over 17 years of this. This is what they grew up in. And this is where they're at. Um, so one of the brothers, Judah, says, hey, what will we gain by killing our brother? We might as well make some money out of this. They see a caravan of traders going by. So they pull them out of the cistern and sold them for 20 pieces of silver to the traders in Egypt. Um, and then 29 basically talks about Reuben. I guess he went to check on something because he wasn't there at the moment. So he comes back and finds that the boy's not in the, well, in the cistern. And, and, and so he actually had a plan to like secretly pull him out and deliver him to his father. So again sly deceiving kind of some other wickedness there where he's like i'll take the credit and bring him back since i, I have enough conviction not to kill the dude well i'll just take credit of you know, you know twisted twisted family we have here okay so the brothers killed a young goat dipped joseph's robe in it and verse uh, 32 they sent the beautiful robe to their father with a message look what we found doesn't this robe belong to your son so this is another thing here to think about they didn't even deliver the bad news to the father themselves. I mean, if something that tragic happened, surely you'd just... But again, they, I mean, they were in such a wicked situation, they couldn't even you know, do that themselves. They had a messenger, hey, take this to our father and tell him you found it here and blah, blah, blah. So the father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn into pieces. He mourned deeply for his, uh, he, he ripped off his clothes, uh, dressed himself in burlap, and mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, and he was just super, super just torn, killed. This, this wrecked him. Um, the next chapter in 38 really talks about Judah, and again, that's a whole other shebang. So let's skip over to 39, because you're thinking like, Things are really bad for, for, for Joseph at this point. Sold off to slavery. We don't know where he's going, what's going to be made of him. But verse 2 in the next, 30, chapter 39, verse 2, the words say this, The Lord was with Joseph. 
So when traders were taken, uh, verse 1, when, Je- when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer, and Potiphar was captain of the guard of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So f- the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of the Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. So wow, this terrible circumstance happens. He, I mean, can you imagine him just being left in the cistern, even if it's for 10 minutes? I mean, just like the, 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 the turmoil he's been through and then to be pulled out. Okay, great, y'all are getting me out. No, now we're going to sell you off. The first human trafficking event mentioned and we're going to sell you off. You know, you're, you're out of here. So he's just doomed. And then he begins to serve wherever he, you know, he, he, he lands and he begins to serve. And in that serving, God has favor on him. God, the Lord was with him. And everything he did pleased him. So eventually Potiphar promoted him and said, man, I'm going to put you in charge of this and that, and then this and that. And then pretty much before he was running the whole house for Potiphar and everything he had uh, control of. So you think, all right, things are looking up for this guy. This is good. A little hardship, a little tough time, bad family life. He's overcome, and now he's on the good road. However, he was a lot like me. He was a good-looking guy. And Joseph was very handsome and very well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. He said, look, you know, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. uh, No one here has more authority than I. Uh, He's held nothing back from me um, except you. You are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would also be a sin against God. So, I mean, you're seeing his moral compass here. He's saying, you know, it's not right. He's trusted me. And even if that wasn't a problem... God, you know, this isn't allowed by God, and it would hurt, you know, so he was a man of integrity. She grabbed him by his cloak. Come on, sleep with me, Joseph. He tore himself away, uh, but left his cloak in the house. This is the second jacket this guy has lost. I mean, like, he is having a tough time with this situation. He should just not wear a jacket or a cloak ever again, because they're causing nothing but problems. Uh, When she saw that she was holding his cloak, he fled, which is, again, very admirable. I mean, there's another verse in the Bible that talks about just flee from evil, and that's what he did. He just ran for it. She called out to her servant and said, look, this guy tried to take advantage of me. You know, tell my husband. And she tells him, look what, he, what's, what this guy happened. Here's his jacket. Here's the evidence. And Potiphar was furious when he heard of his wife's story and how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him in prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. Are you kidding me? You know what I mean? Like, we could stop right here. I'm like, this guy's got, we, we can't complain any anymore. You know what I mean? Like, this guy's had some serious ups and downs, ups and downs. He's back at the up, and then boom, all the way back down to the bottom, thrown in prison. And the Lord was with Joseph in prison, and he showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Started from the bottom, now he's going back to the top. He got to be a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put him in charge of all the other prisoners. And over everything that happened in the prison, the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything and the Lord was with him and caused everything to, uh, he did to succeed. I mean, like, wow. Um, So that's that's what's going on. And so um, back to the dream. Okay, so Joseph kind of got in trouble with these dreams. Well, now some dreams kind of help him get out of trouble. In chapter 40, Joseph interprets... Uh, two dreams sometime later, while Joseph was serving um, with the warden, two of Pharaoh's officials, a cupbearer and a chief baker, were jailed. They made the wrong person mad, okay? So I don't know if they cooked a bad cake or dropped a w- cup of wine on, on the Pharaoh, but bad enough, these dudes were tossed into jail, coming straight from Pharaoh's courts all the way to jail. But they had these mysterious dreams, and Joseph interpreted them. His predictions came true. The chief baker, long story short, in chapter 40, I'm summarizing for you, but the, the, uh, the chief baker, he predicted that he would be killed and that the cupbearer would be restored uh, in the palace. So it was like bad news for you, good news for you. And so he pleaded with the cupbearer. Hey, he says, hey, when this happens, remember me, um, that Pharaoh may let me out of this place. He said, don't forget me. Uh, and another cool thing I hear is like he didn't cry about his circumstances. He didn't say like, "Man, you know, I'm not even supposed to be here. This is what happened. My mean little brothers." 
I mean, he didn't even say any of that. All he said was, I was um, prisoned for something I didn't do, and I was kidnapped from my, my homeland. And if you could remember me with the Pharaoh, maybe he will let me out. And so I don't know, too, if he's just sitting in there for so long that maybe he's given up faith of, uh, uh, with, with God. Maybe he's thinking, well, maybe God has forgotten me, and I'm just going to be here you know, with the warden all these years. Maybe this is him maybe taking a, 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 a reach out in his own will you know maybe it's him saying you know like maybe god's not doing anything maybe i need to make something happen hey you know can you remember me but either way i mean we could relate sometimes if we had to wait for god to do something for a month i think we're tested you know what i mean like if we're just like oh god's gonna do this i know it and three to four weeks go by we're probably already thinking yeah god's forgot me now you know here's a dude for years has gone through these trials and these circumstances and yeah this might be his his flesh starting to kick in and think, you know, well, maybe I need to make something happen. We don't know for sure, but that's just a thought. But we can relate. We can relate of that hard time and thinking, well, maybe, maybe I can make a way this way or what. But nevertheless, uh, just as he was kidnapped from his homeland. Oh, yeah, he told that to the guy. So Genesis 40. Let's look at this verse. Pharaoh's birthday came around three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned up the cupbearer and the chief baker to join the officials. Verse 21. He then restored the cupbearer to his formal position so he could again um, hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh also impaled the chief baker as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted in the dream. Verse 23. Here's the blow. The uh, Pharaoh's cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. This dude can't catch a break. You know, so again, that probably wasn't God's plan. That probably wasn't God's timing for him. Joseph is saying, well, maybe if I do this, it'll, it'll get me out of this pinch. You know, we can make something happen. But again, ultimately, it looked, seems like God wasn't ready for that to happen. God had a strategic plan and a purpose for all this, and it just wasn't the right time. So what happened? This dude that, I mean, like, he owed, you know, Joseph a lot. I mean, Joseph predicted this, and it happened. And I mean, I'm sure it gave him some insight on maybe what to do or whatever. But yeah, he forgets. Then two years later, not two months, not two weeks, because that would be crazy, but two more years later in Genesis 41, the day that changed everything. Two years later, Pharaoh has two terrible dreams that no one can interpret. Um, the cupbearer remembered Joseph at this time and told Pharaoh about him. Pharaoh ordered that Joseph be brought from jail to interpret the dream. So Joseph gets shaved up, cleaned up, gets him a shower. And standing there before Pharaoh, the slave turned prisoner made an astonishing prediction from the ruler's dream. You will have seven years of unbelievable prosperity, he said, and then you will have seven years of famine throughout the land. It will be terrible. Uh, what I recommend to you is that you find the wisest man you can and appoint him to organize Egypt so that you'll be ready for this famine. On that day... Joseph's story suddenly took a dramatic change that changed everything. Pharaoh asked, who better than Joseph? He is the wisest man I know. And I'm sure when he said that, he's the wisest man I know. He's probably looking at all his, his officials and his people that couldn't interpret his dream and, and the magicians and all those other, because they had a lot of gods in, in, in Egypt. And so, yeah, he looks at Joseph and is like, this is the man that, you know, read my lunch. And, and so I'm going to trust him with it all. And so this changed it. Things... Um, uh, so that's how at the age of 30, Joseph became the second most powerful man in all of Egypt, the deputy Pharaoh. So a dude that has started from a rough, crazy family, all these crazy ups and downs. Time has passed. 30 years later, here he is, second in command of all of Egypt. And he's not even an Egyptian, which is another cool uh, thing. I mean, he shouldn't be here. But, but because of what God orchestrated, here he is. And so back on the farm in Canaan, Jacob, Joseph's dad, sends his boys for food because things are getting rough. Let's see. Let's read uh, Genesis 41, verse, 50, uh, verse 54 and 55. Seven years of famine began just as Joseph had predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding counties, but throughout Egypt there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine th spread throughout Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go see Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So the next verse, so that's what's happening. And so it hits. And then back, in the farm, back on the farm in Canaan, um, Jacob, things are rough, and he sends his boys to go get food. So he sends the ten brothers to travel to Egypt 
Of course, Benjamin can't go because Benjamin is his favorite wife's other son, his second favorite, favorite kid. And so he definitely is like, Benjamin, you're staying here with Dad. You other kids, you other ten, uh, y'all go to Egypt and get us food so we don't die. Things were really that bad. And so he sends them on their way. And so they come in. Um, in Genesis uh, chapter 42, verse 6, since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt in charge of selling all the grain to the people, it was him that those brothers came to. Uh, when they arrived, they bowed before him and their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them and asking them, where are you from, he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him, and he remembered the dream as he had many years ago. He said to them, you are spies. You, can, uh, you came to see how vulnerable we are. So, again, I think, I mean, it's this kind of great patience here because, I mean, I think any of us would have just, I don't think we would have played it cool as he did. And so although Joseph recognized them, he, he plays that off, and, and they say, no, my Lord, they explain, your servants have simply come to buy food, verse 10. And 11, we are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Honest men? Are you freaking kidding me? I I mean, I can't believe Joseph didn't just lose it right there and just go off on these guys. You got to be kidding me. Honest men that, 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 that stripped me. I mean, probably just tormented him as a kid anyway. But then, you know, left them for dead, sold them, forgot about them. And you want to tell me you're honest men? Like, oh my gosh, there were 12 of us. And so he said, yes, yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You were basically saying that they're spies. You've come to see how vulnerable our land is. Sir, they said, there are actually, they're actually 12 of us. We are your servants, all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. And I think that's where it really hit Joseph tough. Um, so it would have been a lot easier. This is not, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it would be a lot easier for Jacob, Jacob, I mean Joseph, just to have revealed himself to his brothers at that time, um, and have like an instant reconciliation with his family. But instead, he is patient. He wisely concluded that all his brothers would have to travel back to Egypt. And he, it's a longer conversation here in uh, verse uh, or chapter forty-two. But basically, he tells them, he's like, you know, okay, well, you know, first he says, like, you know, well, you're all gonna stay in prison until that younger brother comes and proves that you know you're not lying to me. And then he says, no, that's, that's not going to work out. So then he says, one of you can go, or if one of you can go back. And he's like, that's kind of dangerous. They can't carry even food. My family's going to die. Because again, he had a heart for his family. So instead, he changes his mind again. He says, this is what's going to happen. One of you is going to stay. The other nine are going to go back. And you're going to bring back Benjamin if you want any more food. And, and if you want to get this other brother as, out of jail. And that's how you're going to prove to me that you're not lying. Okay, so this is a pretty smart plan. Joseph's a wise dude. Um, and so he was patient throughout this um, to make them come back and, 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 and prove them. His motivation was love, and his purpose was to bring repentance and reconciliation. Because again, like he's a powerful guy. If he wanted revenge, he could have had that. But instead, he, he, he really had a true heart for his brothers and his family. So in, in chapter 43, all the brothers returned to, to uh, Joseph and um, you know, they, I mean Jacob, and they report back what happened. And, and from there... Um, they, they fill in, been his brother, I mean, uh, uh, their father about what happened, and we've got to take the younger brother, Benjamin, and he is anti. He's like, no way. This has already happened. I've already lost one son. I'm not losing another. And again, could you imagine this happening when they, he says that? There's no way you're taking Benjamin. But he's already got another son in prison in Egypt that he needs to go redeem. But he's like, no, nah, I, I mean, forget that guy over there. I mean, Benjamin's my favorite. I'm not letting him go. I mean, this is a twisted, jacked-up family, so... Maybe we'll have to talk about Jacob in another series. Um, but anyway, so he sends them on their way um, over time because they, it's really bad. And he's like, y'all got to go back and get us more food. We're all dying. And they said, we can't go without Benjamin. He gives in and says, fine. And his brothers you know, just basically vouch and swear like, hey, nothing's going to happen to him. If anything does, one of them even says, you can kill my sons. You know, if anything happens to your son, I, you know, I'll protect him with my life kind of thing. So they're all serious about saving their lives here at this point. The famine was that bad. Um, Genesis 44, let's read this, verse 11. They go quickly, okay, this is after, okay, let me jump back. Um, sends them on their way the next morning uh, to, back to Joseph. 
Joseph sees them. Um, he proves it. Um, they he invites them into this house uh, to feast with them. So they're already like, like uneasy about this. And um, the next morning, they all get up. They, and Joseph um, returns his brother back and says, you know, good. You guys all may go back on your way. Take all the grain you want. See you later. The next morning, they load up on their donkeys to head out. Sends them on their way, but plants, has one of his servants plant a silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And when they were a short distance away, they were stopped. Genesis forty four eleven. They all quickly opened their sacks from the backs of their donkeys and opened them. The palace manager searched the brothers' sacks from the oldest to the youngest. Again, they didn't know who the oldest and youngest was, but I'm sure Joseph had an idea. He's like, I want this to be tough. So you start from the oldest, and you go down, and you search their bags, and you claim that something is missing, and these guys are going to be on pins and needles. And then when the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, verse 13, when the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys and again returned to the city. Verse 14, Joseph was still in the palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell on the ground before him. Before it talks about they bowed their heads to him. Then it, they bowed to him whenever they came back with, 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 with their brother Benjamin. But this time, they didn't bow. They fell flat on the ground before um, Joseph because they knew what they were. And this is where I believe his dream was really fulfilled. I mean, this is the third time he's seen his brothers, but this time they're all together and they are truly bowed down to him. Verse uh, 15, What have you done, Joseph demanded? Don't you know that a man like me can predict the future. Judah answered, Oh, my Lord, um, what, can you, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? And remember, they really were innocent. They really didn't steal this cup. And they, he says, God is punishing us for our sins, my Lord. We have all returned to be your slaves, all of us, not just our brother who had, um, who, who had the cup in her sack. So there's... The thing that got me on this one is saying, God is punishing us for our sins. But they didn't, they're not talking about that present sin that they're accused of because they really didn't do it. They are truly getting to a place where they're saying, we have messed up, we have sinned against God, and God is repaying us for what we did wrong. I mean, this is a true, down deep repentance here um, and remorse. And so Joseph says no, uh, because they're saying basically, let us all be your slaves, just send Benjamin back. Don't, don't keep Benjamin, the one that, who actually was found with the cup. He's innocent kind of deal. said, no, Joseph said, I would never do such a thing. Only the one man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go back to your father in peace. And Judah speaks for his brothers in Genesis 44, verse 32. My Lord, I guaranteed to my father that I would take care of this boy. I told him if I don't bring him back, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay as your slave instead of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see this anguish of the father. Okay, guys, this is the same brother who had the idea to sell Joseph to the, to, to the traders in the first place. 20 years ago, he watched the father of his grief. Knowing that Joseph was sold and knowing the truth, he allowed his father to go and grieve this whole lifetime to this point um, from the loss of Joseph, and he didn't want to see it again. I believe there's a true change in Judah at this time. I mean, you can see him evolving from just that cold-hearted person in the beginning and then 20 years later saying, I'll give my life, whatever it takes, just don't put my father through that type of anguish again. I think the guilt and all this stuff has really changed these people. Joseph couldn't take it any longer. In Genesis uh, 45, the the chapter starts out, uh, there were many people in the room, attendants, and he just yells at them all, get out, uh, so that he's alone with his brothers. And then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and the word, uh, the word of it spread quickly through Pharaoh's palace. He yelled, I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing before him. Please come closer, he said. They, uh, so they came closer, and he said once again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt, but don't be upset. I mean, again, I think there was probably just this shattering moment at that time to hear it out loud. You know what I mean? Because I'm sure it's one of those sins and one of those things that happen that you don't talk about it. You know what I mean? Like their father never found out it was a lie. And I'm sure the 10 of them just, it never happened. And you know what I mean? They probably just push it down, push it down. And so I am sure when they heard him say, I'm the one that you sold into slavery, I'm sure that just wrecked them. Um, 
It was, um, but then he says, but don't be upset and don't be angry with yourself for selling me into this place. It was God who sent me ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine, uh, verse uh, 6, this famine that has ravaged the land for two years will have five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse 7, God, again, God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive to preserve many survivors. I mean, just the heart that Joseph has blows me away. The things that he went through, why isn't he bitter? Why isn't he mad? Why does he even care about these people? You know, but yet he cares about them so much that he's comforting them. Hey, don't be upset. It's okay. You know, I'm like, I mean, wow. And so, so it was, in verse 8, so it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one that made me the advisor of the Pharaoh. He recognizes it. it wasn't his own doing, um, even though I'm sure Joseph worked his tail off in all the positions that he was putting in, and he proved himself in those areas. But he recognizes that it was God that made this happen. So verse 9, now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Koshin, where there will be, uh, you'll be near to me and all your children and grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everything you own. I'll take care of you there, for there are still five more years of this famine ahead of us. Otherwise, your household, households and your animals will starve. Woo. By the suffering of Joseph, physically, mentally, emotionally, the agonies, uh, they had been allowed by God so that Joseph could fulfill God's plan to save many lives. It took one man's suffering and stretching to become who he needed to be so that his family and the nation would be spared through a time of drought. And this began years in advance, uh, leading to the greater good. Joseph, it wasn't just about his life. It wasn't about his comfort. It wasn't about his position, his plans, his dreams. It was about the greater good that God was at work with and that Joseph played a role in that. And so Joseph learned that God had never abandoned him and that his life was not his own, but he was a part of God's bigger picture. The truth of it is, is that we are a showcase for God's glory, not our own. In this book, Patrick Morley is an author, and he has this really great book called How God Makes Men. It was actually our men's devotional book like three or four years ago at the men's retreat. Kevin gave us this book. And there's a quote in there I really love. It says, even in the toughest circumstances, God's plans is always the same, to put his power on display in our lives and bring a greater good, one that will bring him the glory that he, only he deserves. Because it's not about us. It's not about what we can do. It's not about how we look. It's not about our comfort. But it's about what will bring the ultimate glory back to God. That is the ultimate good and the ultimate the plan. Um, so years passed and back in the story of Joseph. And I think Joseph's around the age of 50 or so uh, when his father Jacob passed away. And Joseph's brothers got really nervous. Now they're thinking, to oh crap, now that dad's gone. Now he's going to kill us. Now he's going to really just, just, just take care of us and do, you know, do what we deserve. Um, making a lie about how they, they come to him and say, hey, you know, by the way, you know, before dad passed, he said that he really wished you'd totally forgive us and you know, not harm us in any way, blah, blah, blah. And so it just that news and that, and that, that statement just made Joseph weep. Again, this guy's heart is amazing. And he weeps, and in Genesis verse, uh, chapter 50, verse 20, I think this is the, the, the pinnacle climax of his story. I mean, he goes on and lives another 50, 60 years and has, and has great success. But I think this is his moment right here in verse 20. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me, out of this, uh, brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. This dude was really dialed in to the, 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 the fact that it wasn't about him it was about the greater good. It was about not just saving Joseph's life and sparing it because he could have been dead in a cistern. He could have been killed in, you know, wherever. He could have been beheaded by a mad pharaoh because he dropped a cupcake or something. Who knows? But at this point, he knew that it was about a greater good. And because of what God orchestrated, many lives, not only the lives of my family, who I, for some reason, he still loved and cared deeply for, but also for many people. And so his perspective was right. The ultimate plan leads to God receiving the greatest glory. Everything leads to that. Um, all right. A couple other things I want to share with you that I read that I just thought were so good. Um, 
Christian author Gregory Kalkal, K-O-U-K-L, if you want to correct me, uh, stated in an interview, he said, it's not just that God has a plan for our lives, but that our lives exist for God's plan. And that is the truth that I think is really important for us to know. It's not just that he has a plan for us, because he does, but it's really the other, the weight really is on the second part, is that our lives exist for God's plan. John Piper states in a book um, called Desiring God, he has a quote that says, the pleasure of human beings is not the center of God's universe, God's glory is. It's not about us and our comfort and where we're at and where we, you know, us to be feeling good and feeling important and all that, but, it, but it's really God's glory. And J.D. Greer states in, this, uh, in his book, Not God Enough, he says, American Christian culture typically starts with the assumption that we are the most important beings in the universe, and our God and our, and our glory is the center, central to everything. Therefore, we can see that God is a, as the great divine assistant, a supernatural butler who comes into our lives to save us and help us be and uh, find our best lives now. What a great myth, but what great truth. I think we really do look that God is here to help us, and he is, but it's to, to bring the greater glory, to bring the greater good. You know, it's not about just making you happy, healthy, and content, but yet truly positioning us to glorify him in the greatest way. I'd like to read a page from his book. Um, following that quote he says uh, what you say God doesn't sit around all the time thinking about us isn't thinking about us all the time what it means to be loved by God yes and no and we are the beloved of God we are his prized creation and I mean he he cares for us and he sent his son for us I mean all these are facts God is love and the scripture tells us he never um Never takes his loving eyes off us, but that is not the same as saying that we are the most important beings in the universe. God occupies the center of the universe because he is God. American Christian culture typically states that the assumption, and in many years reading the scriptures, I've failed to notice that the theme uh, um, that is painfully obviously that obvious that God's glory, not man's, is the underlying foundation of God's work. Why did God create the earth? Because it brought him glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm, Psalms 19.1 Why did God choose to reveal salvation to and through the nation of Israel? Because it brought him glory. In Psalms 106.8 God saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. Another verse, uh, Isaiah 48.9 For my name's sake I de- defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you. For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. Thus says the Lord God, it is not your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 36, 22. Another one, why did God choose to save us? Because it brought him glory. Ephesians 1, 4. For he chose us not because, not, um, chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, to praise, um, to the praise of his glorious grace. What does God want to do with our lives now? Bringing him glory. Whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 It's not about you. It's about the greater good that God is at work with. And it's about his glory. I want to end about this one verse where we probably know it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work good for the goods of those who love God and are called by his purposes for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that the son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with him. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So does this mean that God is actually responsible For the hatred, if God's working everything together, is he responsible for the hatred, evil actions of Joseph's brother? Absolutely not. But does it mean that God is so great that he can work out for his purposes when people are even doing the worst? I mean, could he really take these rotten, evil brothers and their scheming and, and where they're at and use that for a greater good and a greater purpose that would eventually bring glory to him? Yes. And so he doesn't allow it 
Um, and, and there's really deeper we could, we could get into that thought. But remember that everything causes us to work together, not just for the nice and easy things, but for God's ultimate glory. Will you all stand up with me as we close on these thoughts? It basically all started with Joseph's mistake. I think it was a mistake, probably the way he shared the dreams. Should, a teen, should have a teenage, teenage Joseph told his family at the breakfast table about his dream, or maybe even that the way he told them, um, for this is uh, put his brother's hatred over the top? Or was this a part of God's will? Did God use a mistake or sin in his plan to ultimately bring him his glory? God only allows the evil to move where his glory can be greater, and in the darkest of darkest of dark, the light can be the greatest. And so that's kind of where we're at today, is just to reevaluate the perspective of where we're at. Because I know in studying and preparing this, I felt a lot of just convictions in areas where I'm like, you know, am I putting myself in the center? Am I naive enough to think that this all is about me? I mean... Maybe that's why we, f- we find shortcomings. Maybe that's why we find discontentment. Maybe that's why we find maybe unhappiness or unease is just because it's not about you. The story was written to have him a part of it. And so God chose to use this man who came from a messed up family, who wasn't perfect, um, chose him to, to, to save a nation. And so the thought of this is, what is God called and, and chose and destined for you to do? What part of this grand story are you playing? You know, and, and the good thing and the good news is that it doesn't matter because even if you're in Judah's spot, maybe you don't even identify to Joseph. Maybe you think, I'm more like Judah. I, I have a past that is so twicky, twisted and wicked and, and terrible, you know. But out of all that, and of all the things that, that, that Joseph put his brothers through at the end, the turmoil, it all led, I believe, to even the restoration of Judah. I believe that there was even a work that God was doing on the side of making sure that this wicked Judah brother even was, was restored. And so not only did Joseph just get to be with his family again, but he actually was really restored. I mean, these guys actually really had forgiveness, and he was an example of true forgiveness to them. And a lot of areas, you can kind of see a parallel you know, of, of Jesus in, in the life of Joseph because he really went through and endured and sacrificed so that others would be saved. And so whether you're Judah, whether you were Judah, you know, it doesn't matter. Whether you're Joseph and you're just trying to live for God and you're trying to do the best, but it doesn't seem that the light of day is coming. It doesn't seem like things are positioning the way that you think they should. It's not about you. Be patient. And have the faith and the trust that he, Joseph had in his God that it was going to be okay. And in the small areas, I believe that we'll start to see the Lord is with you. You know, it might not be the way you thought it would be, but if you look, I really believe that there will be signs and there will be things that God will give you to let you know it's okay. You are not forgotten. You know, yes, this season is really hard, but it's okay. I am with you. You know, yes, that, that, that really did hurt. Yes, that that loss is real but it's okay there's a bigger picture there's a ultimate opportunity for my glory to be displayed my power to be displayed it's okay and I believe that that's the message that we can take from Joseph's life and I encourage us to ponder on that this week because we all can get in these ruts we can all get the perspective back on us when it shouldn't be and that's going to really cause us a lot of hurt and, and, and waste time. You know, I mean, we could be moving forward, but we might be stuck longer than we need to be because, you know, maybe we didn't have to. And I kind of wonder that about Joseph. You know, was he only needed to be in prison for one year, but maybe it took longer to get some things right? I don't know. But I know that God has a plan and a purpose in what he's using, and he'll use it all for his good. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the heroes of the faith that have gone before us, for the powerful scriptures that that you've left for us to be guided by and encouraged by. And Father, I thank you for the life of Joseph as we look at ourselves. And and God, I pray that any areas that we might need correction, that we might need uh, repositioning, we might need a, a change in, God, I pray that you would convict us and show us these things. 
God, help us to truly have the right perspective that it is all about you and that we are, are, are just to, to, to support the greater good. Father, wherever we're at in this place, God, I just thank you that you do a good work in our hearts to realign us. Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook and Instagram at City Church Lufkin. If you're looking for a church home that's in the Lufkin area, we'd love for you to come join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. No matter who you are or where you come from or what life looks like for you, you matter to God and you matter to us. If you've been blessed by this ministry, we'd love to give you the opportunity to help us continue to reach others just like you. By giving your tithe and offering, you're making a way for others to experience the love and hope of Jesus. There's a link in the description box where you can go online and make a donation or you can simply give through text message. Just pull out your phone and text the dollar amount to 84321. Whether it's a one-time donation or a reoccurring gift, every dollar makes a difference. Our God is a God of second chances, a God of new beginnings. Remember, God wants to do something new in and through our lives. The question is, will you let Him? We'll see you next week.